Welcome to the Women in Public Policy Program Seminar Series Podcast at the Harvard Kennedy School. All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hi. I know, well, people are, I know people are still grabbing meals and stuff, but I want to give us a uh, maximum time to um, speak with our presenter. So my name is Hannah Riley Bowles. I'm a research director here at the Women in Public Policy Program, which puts me in the role of hosting this seminar. Um, uh, here at WAP, we are committed to closing gender gaps in the areas of economic opportunity, political participation, health, and education. We have a very ambitious agenda. Um, and this seminar contributes to our ambitious agenda by um, connecting uh, researchers, scholarly work, um, with our community. And it's also part, more broadly, of an effort to um, connect research and practice to, uh, to close gender gaps. So um, one of our uh, norms in the seminar, um, and I can actually ask you up front, are you open to questions during your presentation? Or? However you want to do it, okay, I'm great. willing to do it. All right, excellent. Yeah. All right, good. So we'll, there'll be, um, you'll, the, in it, uh, we'll have questions during the presentation. I'm going to introduce our speaker. I'm already talking to her. I'll get, I will introduce her formally in one moment. Um, but you can, inter in, you can ask questions of the speaker. I ask that you keep the questions to questions. So let's, let's, let's make sure they're questions. And, and I'll point with the seminar. Um, while we appear to be in a small um, seminar room right now, we're actually part of a much broader podcast community. So the, these seminars have been um, downloaded over 11,000 times now. So, so we're, we're actually in a, consider that part of our community as well when you, um, when you ask your questions. And now I get to introduce our speaker today. I am particularly excited, many of us are particularly excited today to have um, Michelle Dugood. She is a visiting associate professor um, at the Johnson Graduate School of Management at Cornell. She's also a uh, professor at um, the Olin Business School at um, Washington University. Um, Michelle has been really one of the, she's really one of the leading kind of up and coming thinkers about power and status and, and, and power and status linked social identities. Um, both how they affect organizational diversity, but also how they affect social interaction, particularly at work. And so um, she's really, uh, we're just thrilled to have you here and have you talking. Today she's going to talk about this kind of provocative um, topic of solos and um, the implications of solo status at work for interpersonal relations, but also has organizational diversity implications. So please more, uh, join me in welcoming. <laughs> I don't know if I can live up to that intro. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so how I started thinking about this work that I've been doing for the last couple of years, oh god, it hasn't been a couple of years, it's getting close to a decade, um, uh, is way back when, and I can say that now, way back when in grad school, um, I started this project which involved, I was looking at the uh, networks social ties, professional, social, um, and uh, philanthropic ties of boards of directors, and how that played a role in a number of different variables. But basically collecting this data involved pouring over years and years of proxy statements. Uh, I still wake up in a cold sweat. Um, and what I found, I found the pattern really interesting. So it seems as though boards evolved from a state of being largely homogeneous to slowly having one or two people who contributed to demographic diversity. And then it just seemed like further diversification just seemed to stagnate. And so this pattern really stuck with me uh, in conjunction with conversations I've had and things I've observed, and it really got me thinking, so how is it that these high status groups, these high level groups, how is it that diversification actually happens? And what are the factors that play a role in uh, actually dampening or stagnating uh, further diversification? So we all know the cosmic stated problem, especially this group. Representation of women at the highest levels has not kept pace with uh, the lower levels. Uh, and some people say, you know, men are to blame for this trend. They consciously and willfully exclude women from the highest levels. Other people say, no, no, no. This disparity represents more subtle social psychological processes about implicit bias and the ability or willingness for women to operate at these levels. 
But whatever the reason, one solution has been to deliberately place uh, some, a few qualified women at the top, and these women will actually act as catalysts. They will counteract negative stereotypes, they'll act as role models for others, and they'll also take on the role of advocate in the hiring and selection process. Uh, but if this solution is working, it is moving at a glacial pace. That's as much animation you get from me. <laughs> I'm a little low tech. Um, so, but, you know, research actually calls into question this idea that women at the top will be very instrumental in pulling women from the lower levels up. Uh, some research actually shows some of mine, uh, Robin Ely's from across the way at HBS, that female solos sometimes actually discriminate against uh, female candidates, against other women, trying to gain membership into their group. And so given um, these findings and sensationalized anecdotes about women uh, sabotaging the careers of junior women, because of course everyone loves a good cat fight, um, Ma uh, management in search of women to fulfill this role of being advocates may look to women who have shown their support for women uh, in the past, who've helped women in the past, to fill those roles. Because it seems logical to assume, assume if you've helped a woman in the past voluntarily that you will be less likely to discriminate against female candidates. Uh, however, there is the possibility that female solos uh, who help other women may feel morally licensed um, to abdicate the opportunity to select a female candidate over an equally qualified male candidate. And so this is where we're going to go. Now, in some previous work of mine, some of my co-authors, uh, we identify value threat as the mechanism underlying uh, women's decisions, solo women's decisions, to select or not select uh, female candidates to join their group. And value threat is basically the concern that people feel about not being seen as a valued member of their work group. And like other types of threat, um, which is, can be associated with stress, uh, other emotional outcomes and psychological outcomes, negative ones, of course. And so people generally want to avoid value threat. Um, so one of the things uh, this women who are solos in high status groups, one of the uh, things that can cause them to experience value threat is being faced with a female candidate with superior qualifications. So in, in work group settings, negative social comparisons on dimensions of group values uh, can affect individuals' reputation, their social standing, their self-esteem, self-image, as well as tangible awards like wages, promotions, and so on. And so when faced, with a female candidate with superior qualifications, a female incumbent, and when I say that, I mean also female souls, because that's what I look at, the only one. Female souls may assume that this individual, this, this woman with superior uh, qualifications, may be seen as a more valuable group member than she is, even co-opted by the majority. So, now I'm not trying to say that uh, female incumbents, female souls, will not feel threatened by superior male uh, but the threat from a, another woman may be stronger because of this similarity. Uh, comparisons are usually more accurate, meaningful, and so on. And there's work by Redmond and Fairchild that shows that women are more likely to sanction other women who outperform them than men who outperform them. So when faced with a female candidate with superior qualifications, a female soul, because of this value threat, may not always be open to having that person join their high status group. But women who actually do uh, keep women out who are newcomers, who, are, who have superior qualifications, are seen in a very negative light, right? They're seen as they're associated with words like queen bee, mean girls, they're seen as insecure, selfish, and really part of the problem of why we aren't seeing women progress through organizations. However, uh, by helping other women, female souls may feel more confident, more comfortable to select a male candidate over an equally qualified female candidate um, if they have helped women in the past so they don't have to worry about these negative identity implications of being seen as a queen bee, as being seen as a mean girl. And this is based all on moral licensing. And this literature basically shows that 
Uh, seemingly pro-social behavior can lead to morally questionable acts because the actors can feel that their good deeds can obscure subsequent negative deeds. And there's a lot of great research on this effect. And I thought that these two kind of drive home the point. So, you know, in this study, uh, they show, the first study, that uh, when people purchase green products versus conventional products, they were less likely to give to charity, and they also stole more and cheated more. And when people endorsed President Obama, they were more likely to describe a job as less suited for African Americans. So after you have established yourself as being moral or not racist, then you feel more comfortable in, act, in acting in ways that could be described as not so moral or even racist, but you've already set up yourself as someone who is good. And so you feel more comfortable, gives yourself more moral wiggle room to act in ways that could be questioned. Uh, so I talked a, a little bit at the beginning about this idea of value thread uh, that we, uh, my co-author Denise Lloyd Lloyd and Pam Talbert um, we looked at. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the context that might actually make people feel more or less value thread. So in a study that I did a couple years ago, we found that one thing that played a role, uh, whether female solos discriminated against highly qualified female candidates or not, was status of the group. So it occurred in groups that were high status much more than when they were low status. And so here's actually some results from that study. Uh, it shows that when women were a part, souls were a part of high prestige work groups, they chose women about 30% of the time. But when it was a low prestige work group, they chose women, female candidates, significantly more. More than double, 76% of the time. So our rationale for this was you know, we all want to be, people say it's a basic need to want to be a valued member of your group. But we all know we want to be part of some groups and respected by some groups more than others. And we are particularly uh, invested in being respected in groups that we think are important for our self-esteem, for our self-image, that match our self-esteem and self-image. And women may be particularly uh, likely to identify with being members of a high prestige work group because a lot of those, the positive qualities associated with those groups aren't necessarily always associated with the category women. Uh, and also, uh, these groups usually are also associated with the more tangible benefits. So between the intangible and tangible rewards, this might actually make women more willing to deal with all those negative effects that we read about and hear about of when women are the only ones, when they're solo like social isolation and so on. However, uh, when a, a low status or low prestige group, uh, you don't get that self-image boost or it's not associated with tangible benefits. And so when you're in a low prestige work group, you may be less concerned, frankly, about what the other group members think. And also, you just feel you would want someone else looking like you to be a member of that. But in addition to, now any member, any member of a high status work group can experience value threat. But there's some other contextual uh, factors that may make Jane uh, worry or about how valued she's seen by her other group members. So another thing that is play, uh, playing out here is Jane's social status. Now, through our socialization in a broader social culture, we come to ascribe different uh, visible characteristics more or less value. And in organizations, uh, the category male tends to be associated with, with greater uh, performance expectations, greater prestige versus the category woman. And these stereotypes and expectations, such as women lacking business acumen, not being quantitative, too emotional. So these stereotypes and expectations, given those, uh, Someone like Jane is much more likely to question whether her group values her or sees her as competent as her other group members. So in addition to social status, uh, Jane is the only one, a solo. Uh, and I, I, some people would say token without the baggage, because now that word has so much baggage associated, but just the only one. And usually people who are the only one 
see themselves or assume other people see them as peripheral or marginal group members. Also, being the only one, that representation, being the only one, may serve as a negative signal about the relationship between a valued contributing group member and being a woman. And also, being the only one, you tend to attend to your gender much more than, say, if you were a part of a larger subgroup. Now, social status and numeric representation can also interact to impact or influence how much value threat an individual experiences. So what female solos are much more apt to question whether their value to the group, whether their value is going to be questioned, than, say, male solos. There's a whole lot of research that shows that there's a lot of asymmetric effects being a female versus a male solo. So usually when men are solos in a group, they feel they're the highest status person. When a woman's a, female, a solo in a group, she tends to think that she's the lowest status person in the group. So there's a lot of things going on when it comes to social status and numeric representation. So male solos, they report that they don't experience as much negative visibility as female solos, or social isolation. Pay has also been seen to be very different. Male solos tend to be paid more than their group members, whereas female solos tend to be paid less. So being a male solo seems to be very, a very different experience than being a female solo. I thought I saw a question. I'm like, with my students, I'm like, if anyone itches, I'm like, you. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so I had two main objectives for this tree, for these uh, group of studies that I had done. And the first is, I wanted to know, will female solos in high prestige work groups who volunteer to help another woman feel morally licensed to select a male candidate over an equally qualified female And I also wanted to examine contexts where individuals may experience less value threat than female solos, and therefore, they were like, less likely to see helping a similar, a demographic similar other as a licensing opportunity to then discriminate against a same-sex candidate. So this is, these were my objectives um, through these uh, few studies I did. So, study one. This is the very beginning and trying to see what was going on. So I wanted to examine the effects of gender and helping an individual's experience of value threat and therefore their preference uh, for a safe sex candidate. And I predicted that male solos would experience less value threat than female solos and therefore they were less likely to see helping as an opportunity to license uh, passing over a same sex candidate. So this was a two by two study. Uh, the male participants thought they were souls as did the female participants. And they were in one, put in one or two conditions randomly. Uh, the volunteer condition, they could volunteer to help. Um, and the no option condition, there was no option or ability to help anyone. And therefore, this condition, people would not have the ability to license future behavior, bad behavior. Uh, and the dependent variable was choice of a same-sex candidate. And I measured how much people experienced value threat. Uh, so if Samantha is a group member, my group, my favor, her over me. Now let me tell you a little bit more about the study um, and how the procedures, how it was done. So at first I wanted to figure out exactly what my participants thought of as a high status group. And so I did a couple focus groups, some surveys, and overwhelmingly, uh, they thought that they wanted to interact with high-level administrators, like the dean, the president, the provost, as well as alumni from high-level organizations uh, and people at the top of those organizations, in law firms and in corporate. Uh, so I managed, I chose the dean's focus group uh, because I managed to convince the dean, I teach influence, as well, <laughs> that uh, he should be a part of my study, be a confederate. So I made a video, and he basically talked about the group, uh, how much he was looking forward to, how important it was, and how much he was looking forward to hearing uh, their opinions on this uh, task that they had. So when participants came to the lab, uh, they were introduced to this idea that the dean was having focus groups which were uh, looking, they were examining, uh, they were assessing the success of the school's admissions process in screening for high quality candidates. 
Uh, after they were introduced to this, they said that they had to actually qualify to be a part of this group. And to do that, they would be taking an assessment of academic ability. And this was kind of a Mensa SAT type uh, questionnaire. Uh, and they were told, after given this information, that uh, they could volunteer, the condition where people were in the volunteer condition, they could volunteer to help a same sex, so if you were a woman, you could volunteer to help this, uh, another woman who is coming in to do this, a study similar to this at a later date, by pinning strategies on how you think that might have been helpful, uh, and the same for men. And people who were in the no option to help, they were given the choice of doing anagrams or word finding. So they're given a piece of paper, do you want to volunteer, yes, no, uh, for the people in the control condition or no option to help condition, do you want to do anagrams, yes, no. So after they agreed, they did the test and it was scored. And uh, all the, the participants were told that they had qualified to be a part of the Dean's focus group and uh, they were given some time to either pen those strategies uh, in the volunteer condition, or they were allowed to do anagrams or word finds depending on what they circled. Uh, after they were given their group members, the names of their group members, these were either uh, three men if you were a female solo, or three women if you were a male solo, and they were told that you have the, since we want better group dynamics, you get to choose whether, uh, who your next group member is, their fifth group member, and they were shown a male and a female, and so they made their choice. So that's how the procedure went. So here are the results of the choices that they made. And of course, they also, at the end, we asked them to, uh, they got a questionnaire, and we had our value <sighs> measures on that. So here are so the did, results. Okay. Yes? So did, did, did they get like test scores of this person? That they're yes. Okay. Yep, the, the okay. test that they were doing. And, yeah. and, and how did those scores look relative to the average test score? So did this look like someone that they was a little bit high? Yep, very much higher, and you know, we switched it around and randomly okay. changed it over so that it was an exact, yes? Uh, was it just a picture of the person or a name? Name, name. Okay. tried to stay away from attractiveness. Right, exactly. Yep, 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 yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so for women, it was when they volunteered to help, they chose a female candidate significantly less than when there was no option to help. For men, men just seem to love men. Um, <laughs> In both cases, overwhelmingly, they chose a male candidate in either in both conditions, whether they volunteered to help or whether there was no option to help. Yes. Do you analyze only those who said yes to the volunteer? Oh, that's a great option? question. Almost everyone said yes. I think in all the studies, I think like one or two people said no. I think they know they're kind of stuck in this room, uh, but most people said yes. Yeah. Uh, Female solos reported more value threat than male solos, and it was that value threat that mediated the relationship between gender and choice of a same-sex candidate. Now, for this study, um, you know, women actually helped. Everyone helped. They actually did pen strategies. So, you know, for the results, it was like, well, is it that there's more licensing going on, or is it that people are like, you know, I done my good deed, check, and now I can just choose whoever I want to choose. So is there something about helping, actually penning these strategies that may be what's going on here versus this moral licensing? So moving forward, I decided to add a condition where um, we assigned people um, that they should help. And I thought that this mapped on nicely to what goes on sometimes in organizations. So, I mean, when I first started as an assistant professor, someone was assigned to mentor me, a woman, and I am assigned often to other faculty members or students, or PhD students, so on. So this idea of assigning women to help other women is uh, pretty true to life, I think, in a lot, of, a lot of industries and organizations. But, as you can imagine, people who are assigned to help shouldn't feel the same level of pro-social behavior, like they display pro-social behavior to a similar other versus people who volunteered to help. So I wanted to see that both people would actually be helping and would there be a difference there. And I also wanted to include a condition because I was like, I get it, men like men. Um, I wanted to include a condition where uh, I knew because of previous research that women actually would be helping. They experienced less value threat and maybe they would be, these people would be 
more amenable to having other women on their group and therefore less likely to uh, see helping as a licensing opportunity. And I also, I do not believe that women are innately catty or competitive, but they're contextual factors that play into why they do what they do versus this like, oh, you know, we used to fight for mates and comp So <laughs> I thought it was important to say context plays a big role in what's going on here. So this particular study, it was all, the participants were all women. They were either female solos or they were uh, female majorities, which meant they were uh, majority women in the group. Uh, and so very similar setup to the first one, but in this, uh, there were either they could volunteer to help, were assigned to help, or no option to help. Another difference with this study is that instead, the first study, they reported their value threat. Um, and you know, there are all kinds of problems with reporting value threat. People say that you know, they may be acting in a way that's socially desirable, how the experimenter <coughs> wants them to act, it's, you aren't getting the real thing. So for this one, I had an implicit measure of value threat. So they were told that a word would flash on the screen so quickly that only their subconscious would note it. And when that word left, a list of four words would then follow. And that they should use their feelings at the moment to select which of those four words they thought was that word <clears throat> that flashed. And of the 12 trials, six, half of those, uh, had one of those four words was a value threat word. Outperform, competition, threat, overshadow, devalue, downgrade. And the position of that value threat word in those six trials was random, randomized, as was the order of those tri trials. And then we also, of course, looked at the choice of a female candidate because it was all female participants at this point. And here are the results. So consistent with the first study, uh, women who volunteered to help selected a female candidate significantly less than when there was no option to help. Uh, in addition, the women who were assigned to help also selected a female candidate more than those who volunteered to help. So it's something about this moral licensing that seems to be playing a role. For the majority of women, they were actually pretty balanced. Um, they chose a woman about 50% of the time uh, in all three conditions. Uh, this is just showing, so the, moral, the action was really in the volunteer condition. This is where the big difference happened between the female solos and majorities. And uh, female majorities reported less or identified less value threat words compared to female solos. And that threat uh, mediated the relationship between numeric status, numeric representation and choice of the female candidate. So, for this study, this actually is a bit of a turn for the literature that is uh, the moral licensing literature. Uh, so I wanted to figure out, so I, show, I, I had shown at this point that uh, female souls who volunteer to help uh, will choose, will experience more value threat, and therefore choose a female candidate less than uh, if they had no option or if they were assigned. And so for this study, I wanted to find out, would female souls volunteer to help in order to preempt, do like a preemptive strike? They knew that they wanted to choose a male candidate because they were experiencing value threat, and therefore would they volunteer to help to set themselves up so they wouldn't experience those negative identity implications moving forward when they knew that they wanted to make this choice which they were uncomfortable with or they saw other people might be uncomfortable. And so, very similar setup to the first one, but here's the difference with this one. Uh, women, once again, all women, were in one of three conditions. So in the first condition, uh, the candidates that they saw, the woman was slightly more qualified than the man. In the second condition, the male candidate was slightly more qualified than the woman. And in the third condition, the female candidate was overwhelmingly more qualified than the man. And so I predicted that this condition, the first condition, would be where women would volunteer more. Because here, for the male uh, that is more qualified, it could be, you could easily 
choose a qualified man and people not blink, think you're a queen bee because the man was slightly more qualified. In the last condition, the woman was so overwhelmingly more qualified, even if you helped, if you did not choose this person, it would raise eyebrows. Like, why wouldn't you choose the woman? She's so much more qualified than the male candidate. But it was this condition where, if you had a little moral wiggle room, because it was just a slight difference, that if you volunteered, then you could more comfortably choose a male over a female candidate. And that's exactly what we found. So for the female candidate, there was much, when the female candidate was slightly more qualified, uh, there was much more volunteering to help than say when the male was more qualified or the female candidate was more qualified. And the choice, of course, thank God, um, they actually did choose the female overqualified a whole lot. That made me very happy. Uh, for the male uh, more qualified, they did choose more uh, choose the male candidate more often. And for the female qualified, uh, they chose her. Uh, not so much. So after doing that study and feeling very depressed and drinking a lot of wine, um, <laughs> I really was like, okay, but I do believe it's this value threat. I do believe that it's context. Uh, and so what if, you know, women felt more value? You know, that maybe because we hope that women will only help but also we hope that in the selection process, if they're equally qualified, that we will say, hey, maybe a woman would be great in this position. Um, and, but you know, but perhaps it is this value, this value threat here. So if you felt more valued, maybe that's when you would step in and, uh, you know, be okay with having a female pair in your group. So similar to before, um, but for this, uh, before selecting the candidate, uh, the women read one of two statements, one of three statements. So they either read, we're interested in your thoughts about being the only member of your, of your gender in the group. Please think of five reasons numeric minorities would be concerned about not being seen as a valued member of the group by other group members. Or, Please think of five reasons numeric minorities would be seen as valued members of the group by other group members. And the control condition, uh, the very popular, think of five things uh, about your day yesterday. And so this is what happened. Uh, in the value threat condition, uh, they, were, they chose a female candidate significantly less than in the value condition. So here, they actually chose a woman 70, like around 74, 73% of the time. So when they felt valued, it seems as though they were very comfortable with having another woman in their group. Interestingly enough, uh, this is probably the same as what my males, my male solos were doing, around 70, 80%. So they seem to feel valued in that role. The somewhat depressing part is that there's no significant difference here between the control and value. So even consciously thinking about being, uh, not being valued, and not even thinking about it, like it seems to be there. Uh, consciously writing about it doesn't seem to make a significant difference like versus the control. Uh, so uh, yeah. <laughs> but I was happy that the value, and it was interesting, um, I was talking to a male colleague about this, and when I told him, oh yeah, you know, when they feel valued, and he was like, but they're discriminating against the men. I was like, did I just tell you a whole lot earlier <laughs> data that was discrimination and you had like, like, so not perfect. It wasn't 50-50, which ideally it would be, uh, but yeah. Uh, so then I decided, uh, I was thinking, how we in uh, the theory paper that we talk, where we talk about uh, value threat or introduce the idea, it is that being valued by your group. That's your concern, being valued by your group. <coughs> and so I'm going to see, is it all about your group? Would women be OK um, having a woman be a part of a high status group, just not their own? So going to another group, would, that, would they be OK with that? Um, and so that's what I wanted to look at next. And I also thought that this was uh, somewhat, I draw research from what happens in my own life or things that I see. And so I have uh, 
wash you, there are a couple departments that are all male, or they'll have a junior woman, or and often, or no minorities. And so often I'm asked to have a meeting with a diverse candidate. Um, and of course people will come to me after to find out my opinions and so on. So I thought this idea of you know having an opinion about people in other groups isn't, isn't completely off the charts, crazy, made up in my academic world, in my head. Um, and I think people do this for a couple of reasons, right? <coughs> they want to find out, does this is this person a good cultural fit? Uh, it, draw, it gives some legitimacy, the fact that this person came, no, no one looks like this person, and no one bothered to interview her, you know, and find out, maybe she had questions that she wouldn't want to ask, and, you know, uh, a potential uh, male colleague, that reason as well. And also, I think, to just show uh, the woman or minority, there are people like you here, you can actually talk to them. Like, they're around if you look for them closely enough. Uh, that's another reason. Uh, so, I think that this happens, this idea of women uh, maybe having opinions about their group versus others. So this is where, where, we went, where I went la next with this. And what I, show, what I found was that women were fine having a high status woman, sorry, a highly qualified woman in a high status group, just not their own. Right? So this is, it seems like this is where the threat is coming. It's their own group. And once again, the female majorities are pretty even uh, in, their, in their choice of a male or female candidate. So, uh, it seems as though organizations <laughs> can do something. Uh, for one, just the increase in representation, female majorities were pretty uh, equal when it came to and fair when it came to their choices. But it seems like, apart from diversity, inclusion, feeling valued seemed to have a big effect. If, if the woman felt valued, then she was much more open to having another woman be a part of her group. Um, and it seems like everywhere I go, women seem to be at the center of most diversification initiatives. And I think it's really important to, if, if, if they don't feel valued, this is going to backfire. But more importantly, if it is important to an organization, then everyone should be behind these initiatives and just not women pushing them along. Uh, and maybe this may answer a question, the question, why so slow? If it is that women don't feel valued, it seems like it would be unrealistic that they're going to pull someone in who could potentially be competition for them, um, and if we're not getting the best talent up, then uh, it doesn't bode well for further diversification down the line. So, with that, uh, please, any more questions if you have them? So one thought I had on the, on the last study is you, you have um, your manipulation sort of manipulates two things because it manipulates whether I feel my, I'm, my view is valued but it's also saying women are valuable to this board so it seems like the, the choice there could be driven by me feeling more valued but it could also be driven by oh I just thought about all the reasons why having a woman on the board would be better so I'm going to pick the woman do you do you disentangle that at all? I think I think in both cases. So I didn't layer on the uh, script whether one was more valued than the next. It was just like you have this choice. Mm -hmm. So for the first couple studies, it's this choice for your group, and it was simply you have this choice for this other group. Yeah. So I didn't layer on top. I don't know if that was implicit to them that they were going to be but choosing for another group. But, but, so maybe not the last study, the second to last study is what I meant. Where you, where you um, manipulated, where you... The value, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, Yo, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And I, I, I did you not. Could do, I could, basically, you could create a manipulation that says you're a valued member of this group without tying the value to mm -hmm. the gender. Yeah. I don't know how much that matters for the theory or not. Yeah. Like being yeah. a valued member... Yeah. Regardless of gender? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely put them together. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. This entire one would probably be cleaner, absolutely. I had a question that's on the same 
um, a study and the sharing value threat that was like, so I was kind of puzzled that when women don't feel valued, they don't want to select, select another female candidate because they're also changing the group um, you know, representation dynamic so it would be then three men and two women. Yeah. So they could then have a chance to feel more valued as not the only, only one. Right, and like vice versa for the other condition. If women do feel valued, wouldn't they want to then keep being the only one? Yeah. So I was just yeah. kind of puzzled about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, no, I, I think about this one a lot because I was like, but it seems as though from, the, from when I look at the men, it seems that like being valued allows you to then feel like you can include other people who you actually really want to include, but because you feel like at the end of this, you know, people are gonna not, are gonna rate me this way or they're gonna see me this way. So it seems to open them up to allow other people in. And I think that's what's happening with the men. Uh, like, yeah, I, I, I'm the highest status person in this group, but you know, there's enough love to go around if there are two of us. Yes. So I've, I've heard an argument from, from women, right, who were, you know, more or less solos or, you know, a small number, who said that the problem is if you include more women, you're going to lower the status of your group, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a very practical kind of way of acknowledging what the, the norms are. And in fact, there have been recent studies showing, in fact, this actually happens. Oh, yeah. This is not a fantasy. Yeah. Which is another reason why I, another reason why I think men sometimes will choose other men. Because choosing another man may raise the status of the group. This idea of a pink ghetto, right? right. As soon as there are a lot of women, hey goes down, there goes the neighborhood. So yeah, people also think of it as practical. But I think, I think people think of that more distally than, I think first they think of how is this gonna affect me? Versus, I think it's a, a leap to then be like, yeah, this is really gonna, the more women here, chances are the staff of this group is just gonna go to hell. But yeah, absolutely, and there's a lot of data. Well, I, just to say, you know, I heard this from a, a very, you know, an incredible doctor researcher, right, who was, who was speaking, so it was not, and you know, she, I mean, she recognized the system was broken was was basically what she was saying, but you know, but given that that is the norm, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I saw a hand over there. So did did you look at uh, the effects of race and uh, class on on this? Because like, if, if it's a low income minority male, like you might choose somebody differently than a high income uh, majority female. Absolutely, and I think that. <laughs> I, I did not. I, I, I'm very interested in the interaction between. But I mean, like, were, 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 was everybody kind of. It was a pretty homogeneous okay. group. Like, many of these uh, studies are um, from our university pool of people. So I would love to, and I, I think there's just so much out there in terms of interaction of uh, gender and race and class that it's a little challenging to do given our. I would love to do so because I think I don't think it's necessarily people think oh it'll be the same pattern I think there's it's going to be a little more complex than that this might be a huge jump in external validity but I'm going to ask it anyway sure um, the one study where you look at the um, man who's slightly more qualified or the woman who's slightly more, mm -hmm. more qualified or the woman who's much more qualified mm -hmm. really rings true to me in this election season um, uh -huh. anyone else feels that way so I was just any thoughts on that perception, um, which is, I think, growing more with the debates as to who is, are they slightly more qualified or is Hillary Clinton much more qualified? Because I, I just think that that message really came through to me in your presentation. And I didn't know if, like, you know, choosing electoral politics is, like, really far away from, like, choosing for a job candidate. So I, I, I think that. Uh, there's just so many other, there are more, when I think about what's going on, other things jump out to me more than this. Like right. women having a double bind. Like you can be, you know, competent but not nice. And you know, if I read one more time that Hillary Clinton is shouting, mm -hmm. and like, why are they all shouting? Mm -hmm. Like it seems like all of them are shouting. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think for this election, there's so much else going on, right. but I, I can see that 
I don't. I, I think that there's much more immediate things, uh, and some of which are still. We were talking this morning. There are still, from a behavioral perspective, that I, I'm like. I don't know what theory would describe mm -hmm. some of the behavior mm -hmm. that I've seen in this election. I don't know what theory. Mm -hmm. I've talked to some of the most respected scholars who study behavior, and I think we're all a little surprised. Of, about what we're seeing, but, yeah. Can I, I just love to hear you muse about how you think. So, so let's take out, like first, take out the, the complexity of the interaction of race and gender, but just let, let's say that you were just looking at um, numerical minority men who are also power minorities and whether you'd expect the same thing. And then I, I would love you to hear how you think it might get more complicated at the interaction. I know we're not, we won't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think I think for male, male minorities, who would be the only one? I actually would expect a similar pattern. That's what I would suspect. The same value threat, I would expect. Uh, no. I think for black women who, so I, I, I think it was, I can't remember where I heard, there's a woman from Catalyst who came and gave a talk and she was like, this is the most stagnant pool when it comes to board directors or top management teams. It seems like there's uh, more black men, there are more women who are getting on boards, but there just seems to be no movement at all with black women. It's just stagnant. Um, and so I think maybe, and I, I think those women may experience even more value threat because it just seems like there's just very little room. Uh, and another somewhat depressing fact, I, so I'm a, one of um, my colleagues in the law school, apparently uh, being, it's hard for lawyers to be on boards of directors, people don't want to be lawyer too, um, and it's hard for women as we know to be on boards of directors, and so she has this like class slash boot camp to get women, female lawyers who are interested in board uh, seats um, to we, we send them through all the cases, uh, recruiting companies come and so on. Um, and it's interesting, where was I going with this? I had a the double minority status or the double non-attractiveness? What does it matter? Oh, one of, of the... So one of the women who ran, runs this said, you know, she was at another meeting and she was like, most organizations aren't looking, like they're like, we're concentrating on gender and moving those numbers. Race at this point is really secondary to us. Mm -hmm. And I was like, really? And then I was talking to someone else and they said, and they went to some conference in France and they're like, yeah, that was the same message we got. We're really, really focused on gender and moving that needle, but you know, we can't, there's just, we just, we're just, putting our eggs in that basket in terms of diversity. And then I guess I started connecting with us. I was like, oh, maybe this is why there's not a whole lot of, there needs to be more black women on boards. This, there needs to be more diversity on boards or there needs to be more women on boards, but less. And so people, I think, feel less pressure to uh, change that number versus <laughs> women. Can I ask you one follow-up question? Absolutely. But it, so would a, um, would a power minority man or a woman, power minority, okay. you know what I mean, so I don't know, person of color, man of color, Hispanic mm -hmm. or black in the United States, yep. say, on a board, or a woman, would, would like a woman look at, would you have potentially that power minority competition if it wasn't like, if it wasn't woman to woman, but it was like woman bringing on black man, or for black man That's looking at woman question. coming on board, would there be any sort of like, okay, now we're, the That's composition of the board is kind of changing, or we're going to be the two tokens, or I mean, would would that would, that there, would there be great, would there be bleeding across? The <coughs> that is a great question. Well, for sure, if this effect, if it is that more minorities means that we're ghettoizing things, that'll play a role. Um, will they feel with a black male there? I can feel competition with a black female. I assume you would feel more competition potentially with a white feel, but that's a great question. I, I, unfortunately, I can't draw on any data that, what's your intuition? I don't know, I just seem, it seems possible. It just seems possible if they were gonna hire another minority, another power minority, 
who looks really good, would you then be the le le less valued power minority in the room? Yeah. So, so if you could abstract a power minority outside of race and gender, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether there there, there would be in group affinities or, or similarity I mean, I dynamics, the, or I, I don't know whether like similarity would make these things yeah. more salient. I I, I, don't, I mean, it'd be interesting to think about. And does the male power minority? feel valued because he identifies or people identify him more with maleness than minority. Yeah, if he feels more like one of the guys and he might be, not be threatened by her, if yeah. he really feels like he's the minority, minority representative, representative on the group, if he was made to feel that way, then... And, yeah. I have a general thought about the underlying mechanism. And the value threat seems a very reasonable and logic explanation here. And I wonder whether what I have in mind, which I will explain in a moment, is also value threat or something different. Mm -hmm. And what I have in mind is maybe women um, appear not selecting other women as often as we would like them uh, to do that because they weren't, they have a strong motivation to appear impartial and not biased in their decisions. Mm -hmm. Now, it could be also related to value threat because. The, the, the logic, implicit or explicit, may go, okay, if I select another women, other people may think that I'm selecting the other women just because I like the other women mm -hmm. and not for her uh, qualifications, yep. and hence that may appear, that I may appear in the eyes of others as also not qualified, but being hired because yeah. of being a woman yeah. or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I so I'm wondering whether oh, yeah. this yeah, yeah. is also value threat or it is. something different? Yes. So I wish you were my reviewer a couple years ago. Yes, so a part of uh, that paper, we have three types of value threat. We call that favoritism threat. The fact that women may not uh, select other women or minorities, it was a theory paper, so we thought of it very broadly. Uh, a low status person, uh, traditionally low status person, um, because they might assume that they're being seen as, you know, this is a meritocracy, but you are basically basing your decision, exactly what you said, on similarity. On similarity. And how, it can be a value, remember, if that's how you're operating. So, and we also, so this we call, this one, competition threat, when it was a lot of people, that was favoritism threat. Right? And we also uh, identified what we call collective threat, which is, yeah, there's a pair of qualifications, but we also don't want people with low qualifications because, you know, uh, I've worked really hard on this, in this high status group to make sure that, you know, I've not highlighted any negative stereotypes about women or minorities, and then this person comes in and acts that has lower qualifications and reinforces and undoes all of my work. So those are the three types of threat that we talk about in the paper. Yeah. This is kind of a general question. But what about people who just like being so low? You know, you know, there's, you know I, I feel there gets a, to a, a time where you hear people say, I've been the only one yeah, as, yeah. as for as 20 I know. years. Yeah. And you're like, well, no. you know, did you not? You know, so yeah. I, I find, you know, I'm just interested in how that might shape. Oh, yeah. Know, so I mean, I think individual differences shape every type of research. Uh, I don't, I'm not an individual differences type of person. Uh, I uh, and I think if the environment's strong enough, it tends to dampen individual differences anyway. But yeah, I think identification, how much you identify with being a woman, if you are you know, if you are accustomed to being like this and so social isolation, why are you talking about social isolation? You know, I'm fine. So I think all of those, and frankly, those individuals may not feel as much value to that. You know, they're like, I'm accustomed to this. Uh, of course they value me. So I think that, yeah, definitely that would Oh, I heard some. Oh, sorry, <laughs> can I? I heard some women saying that. Well, I've been working with other men for twenty years. I just don't know how to work with other women anymore. Mm -hmm. So that that would be another reason, even I though it's not the value threat. True. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I assume that if they gave it a chance, it would be just fine. <laughs> 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 but if you're the solo, then it's high risk to give it a chance. Exactly. Yeah. And it might be just fine, but you <laughs> might think of it as. Not funny. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Just a quick question. On the first study, those who volunteer, who had no option to volunteer, men and women, uh, participants were equally likely to favor 
well, sorry, both favored the male candidates yes. disproportionately, but was that even among the female participants and the male participants? Does that make sense? So, so all of the participants in the survey mm -hmm. did not get the option to help preferred the male candidate. Yes. But if you split out female participants and male, was there a significant difference, there a difference between the yeah. two? Yes, there was. So women who did not chose a woman less than men who did not. So I think it was thirty something percent and like seven percent. So there was a significant difference in that those conditions of no option to help when it, uh, in terms of gender. So that's even more depressing, right? Because that means. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a difference between those two. Yes. Yep. Uh, I don't know if you know, but Francois Giroud, who was one of the first French ministers about 40 years ago, said that equal rights between the sexes will only be uh, attained when mediocre women occupy high positions. So what I take from your study is that it's going to take at least another 40 years before we get there. Um, which is a very good point also, like when you have, um, like I've noticed in my work, like each time, instead of defending why I would hire someone or take them as a position for saying how qualified they were, I always say, well, I don't see that they're less qualified than this other guy around. Yeah. And that changes the lens and the perspective because that forces the other person to justify why yes. they would be more qualified. Yeah. So I'll say, okay, fine, I understand. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. the same. She's as incompetent as, as he is. <laughs> yeah. and, and, that, it, and, and in that way, it kind of like shifts a little the perspective. That makes least. a lot of sense. So. Mm -hmm. The um. So um, have you? You, you have looked at the, so you, could you just talk a little bit about the race, because you have looked at value threat with regard to. Race? No, have you? No, I wish you I did. Not. Okay. I wish I did. I just, so I do, I, I run experiments, and we just are, both schools. You can't get that. It's yeah. like the numbers are just so low. Uh, the only minority group, I, my Asian population, I think I could put, no, in terms of Latino, Latina, Hispanic, African American, Black, it's yeah, maybe over a lot of years. Um, <laughs> but I could, you know, but initially, yeah, I, but I, I am, because it's. You can set some of these up to be online. I could, but that high status group mm -hmm. creating that yeah. is tough. Yeah. When you do it with M Turk, yeah, because yeah. I trust me, I've been like rattling around in my head, organize going into organizations. I, I run into the same problem about the numbers. Well, um, one thing that um, I've done and uh, friends of mine have done is we've created groups on M Turk mm -hmm. using sort of like the M Turk culture. So oh. we'll be like, you have to rate another M Turker's work. Mm -hmm. and decide whether their work is high enough quality to be in the same, like we promote them to like a master Turker mm -hmm. kind of thing, but like for us as an MTurk requester. Mm -hmm. And then you say like, okay, like you now, because you've been promoted, now you'll be evaluating other people's work to decide if they can also oh, be in this and qualify idea. for our higher paid hits and all that kind oh, of I stuff. Oh, I need to talk to you, because maybe that's the way, because I, I was like, how can I, it was clear to that, uh, you know, I had them in this group with a D, and people, oh, I should have said that, you know, people who didn't qualify would be taking part in the study, or an administrative assistant who was doing a, a study for her class, and so they definitely thought of this as a high status. Group. I think it wouldn't be as effective, but, but I, it does but it have could, that status. It could help, like, it might work. Yeah, no. I'm willing to try, because I, I, I think it, it's important to figure out if there, and I think they will be. Undergrads and grads. Undergrads and grads. I mean, one of the things I wonder is that these are people who don't actually have a lot of experience being in, you know, the actual world of boards and. Yeah. Oh yeah, lives. absolutely. And so, like, you know, I, I, this is perhaps this is a, a question coming from a humanist that everyone who does experimental research is like, ah. But like, how do you extrapolate from a twenty-year-old to a fifty-year-old? So the MBA students do have work experience, okay. and they 
Okay, and there is yeah. no significant difference okay. in how they act versus how the other guys act. But there is some extrapolation that's going on for sure. Well, because one of the things I'm thinking is that middle-aged women do have different reactions often to, um, you know, whether it's Hillary Clinton or whether it's you know, women in the workplace. And so I wonder if there's research to be done that shows like women who do have decades of experience, maybe they don't experience value threat in the same way. Maybe they experience it more intensely, maybe they experience it less intensely, but. Um, I would hope they, and you know, I, I started thinking about this through boards, but I, I then moved to high status groups in general, whatever that may mean. And I would think like some of my MBAs would say, I'm not a high status group. Um, and they might be in an organization. But I definitely think that the higher you up you go, they probably experience less value threat. Mm -hmm. And so maybe they are more open. But yeah, this I, I'm definitely doing some extrapolating uh, because I'm using uh, a student sample. Great, so one thought and one comment. But um, on the race part, I was thinking about you know, what you're saying about communities and stuff. I know there's definitely work in African-American studies about how black women tend to kind of be at the front lines of a lot of movements for black men. Um, then there's a lot of criticism <laughs> about, um, uh, you know, when you think about the beginnings of like the black power movement or, you know, even right now with like, you know, Say Her Name and Black Lives Matter, that um, you don't see those same kinds of reciprocity. So I'd imagine perhaps, you know, that you would expect that black men actually still defer to their you know, like they and get other men, okay and black women will be, yeah, willing to branch, branch out. So that's just an idea, if just looking at from African American studies. But my other question was just interested in names. So, what names you used? Oh it's yeah, also there were all this like, work on like names. Yeah, we, what we did, we just chose from like the most popular names. So I think it was Kristen and Stephen, or Samantha and Stephen. So we just chose and they were popular dispersing. names. Yeah, dispersing because. Like attractiveness, last names also have their own baggage. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, um, so a couple of things come to mind. One is the, the study 15 years ago at MIT, right, on the status of women. Um, and, and that was actually, to me, that was a sort of landmark kind of event because, you know, the women got together and laid it at the doorstep of the organization systemic discrimination and the organization agreed and said yes and then the ripple effect of that actually moved on over to Harvard right because Larry Summers was addressing some of the same women and you know putting out this whole thing about you don't look presidential you know that stuff right it's like for women, it was inherent in women that they were achieving right and ultimately he poisoned the well for himself and for other men, and I see this playing out in the election as well. You know, when um, Hillary said, if you're playing the women's card, deal me in, right? You know, it's this actual um, statement that women are accomplished, high achieving. You know, it's the, it's the kind of validations, I think, um, that ultimately will move the needle. And, you know, I, I mean, to me, this is what we're seeing playing out now in this, in this election. That, that women are hearing all these kind of crazy statements about themselves and, and universally rejecting it. You know, women can't look presidential I mean, just because. Um, so, you know, I don't know how you can apply that to your work. <laughs> that, but that is really, thought. that's really the trick, you know, is how do you, how do you go from, um, be, because, because as long as you're, you're a solo, and you're, you're taking, you know, everything is personal, right? It's coming at you. I think it's very hard to deal with that. I, I you know, I think, I think this is sort of having more of a kind of corporate action from a group of women, uh, which, which, you know, plus a whole bunch of data, which, which actually moved the needle at MIT a long way. And, and like I say, you know, c continued to ripple on.
let's hope you know all of us benefit from from that. Yeah. And I also think, I mean, because Donald Trump is doing completely the opposite in terms of his approach to gender. I think she had to definitely say something like, it's not we can't always talk about women's physical features, and that it's appropriate that her to say you know, not even smart and competent. going on with your research like replicated in um, kind of like party leadership or the upper professional level, where you really see women um, struggling for a number of years to try and get other women in and working together across parties um, and that kind of thing and maybe it's just maybe the bias in my region's research is not advanced democracies but I think that tends to be the case and so I'm kind of wondering like is it something about like being the only woman and not having anyone to work with or is it something about like what they think they're doing in this group you know, or I mean, I know you don't say politics, but I'm, I'm just kind of puzzled because I, you know, I, I've talked to party leaders who say like, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't run on that ticket. I said I wouldn't run anymore unless they put another woman in the district somewhere else because I'm sick of this and this kind of thing. Like, uh, yeah. So uh, I was one of the things I thought about when I got my result about you know not my group but other groups. And I'm like, is there not another moderator here about the type of work you do, right? I, 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 this is that these people are going to be working together right. closely. And then I think about you know my work, us as professors. Yeah, you come together to do joint decisions on a couple things, like hiring and so on. But in general, we work alone. I was like, I wonder, but then I definitely heard professors say that this plays out uh, in their hiring meetings and promotion meetings as well. But I, 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 I also wonder, in terms of the type of work, is yeah. there a it's kind of like, it's not my group, because we actually don't work together in that way, where being valued by this group is really important for the type of work we do, that people depend on me to, you know, we work interdependently and that kind of thing. So I, I definitely, a part of me thinks that that may also be going, because I was like, I wonder if that would play out, that how that psychologically not my group would play out in other ways, even if you are in that group. So I wonder if that yeah. uh, might be the type of work you do. And if that person really is going to be seen, does it really matter if they're seen as more valuable than you? Or if these people will see you as less? Does that even matter in right. you getting ahead? Right. right. Yeah. yeah. So I'm a, I'm a political scientist as well. And as I listened to your answer, I was wondering if another moderator could be about the expected duration of the group. Oh, yeah. So Absolutely. for instance, right, in politics, um, especially in, in systems where it's not the norm to be reelected, there's a lot of turnover. Right, so people are rotating among a party leadership office, an elected office at a local level, a federal level, right? Yeah. And so I wonder if your effect is stronger if you expect these groups to be more durable and more permanent. Oh, I, I can imagine right? that. So if it's a long-term work group versus, well, this is my group for three months, and then we get yeah. reconfigured into other yeah, I think that's definitely as well. Yeah, explain absolutely. some of these differences. I'm wondering if you can tell us about what organization can do in order for female solos to decrease their value of the threat could be to let them focus on their own value, the unique value uh, that can, the unique skills and the abilities they can have to be bring into the group yeah. instead of letting them focus on, oh, I am a minority, I'm a mm -hmm. woman, so yeah. I'm the only person in the group. But if you let them focus on the skills, abilities, what's unique, about me that I yeah. can bring into the group and not be identified anymore with my gender, yeah. Yeah. but with the thing, like with my confidence. Yeah. I think that that would definitely play a role, but I also think that it's, I could think that I am the most valued person ever, but if I don't believe that my group mm -hmm. thinks that, mm -hmm. I think that this might still play out. That, you know, I, I know I didn't get here because of that being a token, right? The, the classic, pop culture word token, you know, we'll bring on the woman because of affirmative action or whatever. If I, I, I think that I'm you know, smart, I have expertise in this area, but I don't think that I'm appreciated by group. I think this would still play out even though I think that I deserve a place in this group. Because this person did score, look, they were told they scored highly, mm -hmm. but it is, you know, what do other people think about me? I was, I was thinking about that. So Denise Lewin Lloyd gave oh, a talk. The duo. Yeah, yeah, about the duo stuff a couple of years ago, and um, 
uh, for those who missed it, there was basically this idea that maybe even worse than being a one could be being a two because then you get um, you get viewed you get more objectified, I guess, as the as the minority rather than you, you, there's less opportunity to individuate. You might be perceived, or that that. But for, I, I forget too. I, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like I peer reviewed it before, but it was such a long time ago. I always and I don't want to. I want to reference it all the time, but I'm like, am I characterizing this? Yeah. Correctly? But part of it I do remember was um, this idea of um, it was kind of like related to idiosyncrasy credits, you know. Just, but she she talked about how if somebody comes in, I, and I think the idea was this person is going to reflect on me um, because we're going to be sort of seen as a, a type okay. or something like that, mm -hmm. and so. It's interesting that you have these, you know, the fact that the women weren't, so, so they're willing to go along with a type who's really great, right? And that could be rational, but it could be that if you add this person to me, we're gonna look like stars together, we're gonna look really strong, right? Mm -hmm. If you add somebody who's of, of ambiguous merit, and I know the world is prejudiced, you the know, there's kind of that argument, yeah, then maybe, maybe that's, Maybe the collective, I don't know whether the collective threat is sense of competition, personally. Collective is, they come in and they're, I don't know if they're good or not, or they're gonna completely <coughs> muck things up. They're gonna muck things up, yeah. yeah. So but by going by your theory, I think your theory was that you they were gonna, you were gonna feel competitive with them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which I think is slightly different than, so it could, it could be, this person's gonna outshine me. Yep. It could also be that this person's gonna make my group look not so shiny yep. anymore, yep. right? Um, or it'd be interesting also to look at um, something idiosyncratic. So she actually told this story of another um, minority female being hired who wore like a very hip outfit or something like that. And she found herself being like very, she had this kind of emotional reaction to what the woman was wearing and then caught herself like you're, that she realized it was just, she, she had a feeling that the way the woman was dressing was gonna reflect on her rather than just the way the woman was dressing or whatever. But you can imagine men would have probably maybe more capacity to tolerate idiosyncrasy mm -hmm. for the sake of maybe innovativeness or doing something different, bringing in somebody different because it won't threaten their majority group. But for a minority person, maybe I mean it might be another thing to look at other than pure competence. Yeah, yeah, You know, yeah, if yeah. somebody was like slightly deviant on a somewhat yeah, like high exactly. variance outcome way or something, um, people maybe minorities maybe less power minorities maybe less willing to take a risk on somebody because it could because that person's failure or success could reflect on them yeah. in a way that for the majority group, the individual the investment it's in the risk. Is diluted. Yeah. It doesn't reflect. It's not going to reflect on me personally. We will have made a try. We tried to do something. You know, we yeah. learned from our mistake or whatever. But that's riskier for the um, power minority. And I'm always looking for a way to work with the names again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's just so wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So along those lines, it seems like a lot of the reactions that we've been discussing relies on the fact that one plus one is two. Like, I know that most board member decisions are discrete in the sense that oh, like one. Reconducting something like this, where maybe it's more of a scorched earth scenario, where we actually need to refer to three new members, and how would you distribute and have that affect whether you're solo or not? Have that affect your choice of membership? Yeah, that would be interesting. And mm -hmm. in looking, and so would they? Because I think it, it. I don't even know. I don't think even licensing. I mean, how do you say? I'm not choosing. There are five people in this pool. Three are women. You need to choose two, and you just choose the two men. That seems like. Even with licensing, a harder pull. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's like um, lot, lots of party lists back in other days. Yeah. People feel more yeah. comfortable in choosing these people. What, at one point, you, you mentioned that at uh, the, the bottom of the control spectrum, the, the, there was a lot more progress for women than men at the top. Uh, and I, I thought this would be interesting. mentioned a couple of times about like is this going to help open up opportunities for other women and if, if you look at uh, heads of state and which countries have had female heads of state uh, most of them are, are not known for being very uh, having high gender equality right like you have Sri Lanka or India or Pakistan or um, you know like the, it, it's not really like 
these places where there's a lot of talk about this and it doesn't seem like there hasn't been any progress because some of them had female heads of state 100 years ago. There's a well, I, mean, I guess I could also agree that I don't think that, I think some people would say that we have the worst race relations now since Obama was president. So similarly, uh, so does this, this has been a solution that's been thrown out, but of course, it hasn't been tested, right? Is it that having more women, because there hasn't been that many increases, and has, will it make things better? Still all empirical questions, because well, frankly, the needle is just kind of stuck. But yeah, I think about this too. So yeah, since Obama's like, oh, having a woman, people are like, things will change. I'm like, things don't change very much. Or some people could argue, it kind of went the other way. Uh, we were talking about this this morning, right? Like, and I, I think uh, Robert Coyne, like, he was like, you know, there's like these. So yeah, so this one thing happened, you know, race relations, like there's equality, there's a black president, but the average black person would probably say, what? Like there's just one person, but things haven't really changed. So, yeah. We're gonna go back to your moral license argument. Yeah, exactly. Look at us. We voted. I mean, come on. Look at me. Exactly. The it's study a meritocracy that you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But I, then it would be, did those people vote? I have a feeling. It's <laughs> yeah. Not. Yeah. 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 I just, you know, I'm just going. But um, I, it's funny because I, th I think that this really does translate to how people to make decisions. Um, but it's interesting too because there's work in like business, and it's, and that's kind of what spurred off diversity stuff <laughs> um, that like when you have women and minorities on boards that institutions actually do better yeah like they earn more money all this stuff but then you also see that people think that the prestige goes down when this ghettoization happens so I'm just I guess curious as to uh, yeah so the research actually is really equivocal on this like mm -hmm. so uh, this years of research where they just draw so they there's a lot of research that just looks at a number of people on boards and how that affects a number of uh, outcomes, ROI, um, I mean, a bunch of different things. And some people would say they've been cherry picked in different ways. So ROI would go up, ROI would go down, and they're gonna report it's better because ROI went up. And the research really, unfortunately, is not as clear cut that more diversity in terms of the data, um, every study doesn't necessarily show that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Very well. Just yeah, this last comment. Is it here that what we get right the result is like the status maintenance? You want to maintain high status because you're really looking at high status growth mm -hmm. and and so does women there, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so women are chosen just if they have a lot of confidence. Otherwise, just men are chosen, right? So what you really want here is that you want to maintain your, the high status of your group, and so either you choose men to maintain the status, or you choose a female just if she's a lot of a lot confident, right? She has like exceptional confidence mm -hmm. that you cannot like, avoid choosing her. So I guess like status maintenance just really plays a big role in this. I, th I think that because the men and women are equally qualified, but then it does if it is yeah, status it status maintenance. Yes, yeah. uh, it is that you do. But since the woman is more qualified than you are, and you seem to think that you're going to do a good job, then so yeah, I, yeah. So maybe I'm hoping that. But yeah, I, I do believe. I mean, there's so much data that shows this whole idea of the more women who come into a profession, that you know. Pay goes down, yeah. status goes down, yeah. and the more men that come in, it goes up. So that is definitely a consideration. Well, you have left us with a lot of really <laughs> wonderful oh. questions. Thank you very no, thank much. Thank you so much for yeah. your questions. And a perfect follow-on to the great questions from our political scientists. Mm -hmm. um, next week, Jessica Robin. Uh, Robinson Priest, who's a professor at Brigham and Young and co-director of the Gender and Civic Engagement Lab there, is going to talk about how to elect more women, <laughs> uh, gender and candidate success in a field experiment. So we'll continue the conversation. Yeah, I should follow up. Yeah. <laughs>